Thank you everyone for joining us for our monthly webinar. Uh, you know, we do this every month. You might be familiar with myself and Rachel, our director of marketing. My name is Hampton. I'm an accounting executive here. Rachel uh, is the one really putting all of this on. But today we do have a special guest um, and, and he's a pretty important part of the WildSpark team. He is our founder and CEO, Cord Sachs. Thank you for joining us. Man, and fired up to be here. Uh, you know, this is the, the really my inaugural opportunity on one of your webinars. So, uh, man, I'm, I'm ready to dive in with tons of great leaders and have a great conversation. Hey, well, Cord has been asking to be a part of these and, you know, we, we've said no the last couple of months. Um, <laughs> man, I've been trying to get on the list. It's just I finally got on. I'm, a, I'm about to get fired on LinkedIn Live, but um, I did post on LinkedIn today that Cord says fired up an average of 100 times a week, and I think I'm right there with him. I'm fired up too. This is going to be great, and I'm excited about this topic because Cord, uh, I think, has been referred to as the culture guy, and, and this was long past a couple of years ago where culture seems to be kind of a buzzword that a lot of people are talking about. And it's good that in our society and in the marketplace, people are recognizing the importance of a workplace culture. Um, but I also think that a lot of times we don't know what that means. We don't put a lot of intention to how we're designing our cultures. And so we just hope that they're good. And so we, we do things here or there to try to create a good culture. But today we're going to really dive into what does that really mean? What are some toxic parts um, that some people may not recognize about their culture and really what's at stake if you're not intentional about designing it. And there's nobody better than Core to talk about this. So uh, I want to start by reading a quote that many of us have probably seen. Core says this quite a lot. Peter Drucker says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Core, why is that quote significant? What does it mean? Well, absolutely. I mean, 20 years ago, over 20 year, years ago, really before culture was cool, you know, you said culture is now a buzzword. It used to not be. And uh, so, you know, over the last 20 years, culture really has, it's, it's moved more center stage as we've seen more and more organizations that really have doubled down on the area of culture. And, and the results that these companies have, you can't point to strategy because the strategy looks very similar to other companies in their industry. But man, the culture that they're building is what they would say. And then now everybody that you can't help but notice is the difference. And so uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, big, big deal. One of my favorite quotes, uh, and we're going to define culture in just a second, but if you think strategy, strategy is just uh, all the ways that you make a business work pragmatically, all your systems, all your processes, uh, all of your strategic growth strategy. Strategy is, is very important. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying you can have a strategy and if your culture is toxic, like we're going to talk about today, it will get eaten alive. Like it will not last. It, the ships will get burned and, uh, and it will be uh, on a, what we call a death spiral downward. So, uh, so you got to guard culture. We do that here. I know we talk about it all the time. So uh, absolutely, we're going we're gonna to dive in. So um, what is culture? Let, let's define it real quick. There's a very simple definition. Uh, the characteristics of a particular group of people. It, it really is that simple. It is, it is what characterizes any specific group of people. And I mean the organizations that you're in, the countries that we live in, organizations have culture, countries have culture, your family has a culture. So I, I don't, it doesn't matter what seat you sit in as an influencer today, whatever, whatever role you're in where you have influence, you might be another CEO on the call, you may be a department head, a VP, you may be a team leader. You may be a new employee. You have a domain, even if it's just your family, where you get to, you get to drastically control and help influence that culture. And so I want you to sit in whatever seat you sit in today and ask the question, okay, how, how I want you to assess. I want you to assess the characteristics of your culture. Um, and then I want you to, to ask the questions. We're going to give you some self-assessment today to ask yourself, how can I improve the culture I'm in? Whether I own the culture, it's like my culture to control. If you lead a team, that's your culture. Uh, good to great, Jim Collins says managers trump companies, and it's a huge deal. Like Companies do have cultures, but you as a manager in whatever seat you sit in can trump the culture, uh, the culture of your organization by simply intentionally designing the experience that your people, the people that work for you, the people that you lead, they experience. So what is culture? It's the characteristics of a particular group of people. 
So let's let's look at a few. I'm going to give you a couple pictures here. I want some interaction in the uh, in the chat. As you see this picture, what words come to mind? Real quick, type them in, type them in, type them in. Throw them in the chat. As you see this picture, what characteristics come to mind? Come on, what do we got? Liberty. Absolutely. What else? What else? Freedom. Okay. What else? All right, now, we're all very familiar with this culture. We live in this culture. See, tons of words that we would all agree upon. Uh, we know a lot about this culture. Let me show you the next picture. Anybody want to take a guess at whose flag this, this, this country, this, this flag represents? All right. It's North Korea. I'm going to give you a hint. You don't have to guess that. That's not the question. Tell me the words that describe this picture now that you know that's the flag of North Korea. All right. Let me see. Put them in the, put them in the chat. Put them in the chat. What words describe the picture that you're seeing when you know this represents North Korea? So we got a lot of really good words for the American flag. Patriotism, sacrifice, freedom, grit. So All right, now let's 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 hear if they're they're slightly different as you move to okay. Okay. We've got no freedom from Robert. No freedom. Very good. We've got uh cold. Okay, very good. Controlling. Uh someone put chains. Okay. Okay, unpatriotic, fear. I see fear. Okay, hey, so let me ask you this question. How many of you have been to North Korea? Anybody? Anybody want to raise their hand in the chat? I'm, I'm willing to bet that we've got crickets right now. So here's the deal. You, you haven't been to North Korea, but you know all these words that describe North Korea because they have a culture, all right? And the culture is how people experience that particular, that particular gathering that they're in. In this sense, there's a particular experience that people have of North Korea. And we and many of us that have never been there before, there's a reputation that North Korea has because of the culture, because of the way that they have built culture within their organization. Let's look at a couple companies real quick. All right. The Apple. Okay. What words come to, make, come to mind? All right. Innovative, of course. Yeah. Creative. All right. World changing. Yeah. Disruptive. Interesting. I think that's in a positive way in many cases, unless you're, you're one of those that's so distracted on reels every night that you can't get any conversations with your kids or, 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 or wife. Very good. Okay. There's, there's words that describe any of y'all work for Apple. There might be a few on the, on, on the podcast, but I bet not. So there's a reputation that Apple has that we all know about because of the culture. All right, what else? Let's get another one. This is a favorite of mine. It's the Chick-fil-A chicken, right? Now, we could put a cow up there as well. What words come to mind? Caring. Right, interesting. What's, what do we got? Caring. 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 My pleasure. What's that? My pleasure. My pleasure. Caring. Excellence. Excellence. Fast drive through lines. Yes. Uh, I see service. Um, I don't know if I don't know if Roberts was expensive for Apple or expensive for Chick Fil A, but I think it was Apple. Uh, <laughs> but either way, like both of them, are, are probably pretty pricey. And guess what? We're willing to go and buy their products and buy a lot of it, right? Okay. Needless to say, we've probably all been to a Chick Fil A. Most of us, if you haven't, you've probably been in North Korea a lot. So, but, but Chick-fil-A has a culture. Chick-fil-A is one of those companies that has, whether we like what they stand for or not, they have changed the game. Economists can't argue with what Chick-fil-A has done on that, in the area of culture that has given them their advantage. So much so that they work one day less, 20% less, if you will, I guess that's, 14% less than any other company in their industry. They don't work on Sundays. And yet they're still, I'm sorry if we've got any McDonald's folks on the, uh, uh, on the call, but they're three times more productive, more profitable than any McDonald's, the second uh, organization that would be compared to a Chick-fil-A. So all I'm saying there is there, and they would say, we're not in the chicken business. We're in the culture business. We focus. They spend one week a year bringing everybody and spouses offsite to a, a remote destination. And all they do is focus on culture. 
They spend multi millions of dollars to do this, and they say it's their greatest investment they make every year. Let's look at one more, one more company. Anybody know this company? It, this, this is a, a, a bit, you know, for some of you younger folks, you, you were born around when this company took its fall. But I'll bet there are some that still, still have heard of Enron. Their reputation has preceded them and has outlasted them by about 20, about 24, 25 years. 2001, Enron had one of the largest scandals in the history uh, of, 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 of corporate corporation, public corporation fraud. Uh, the executives stole $47 million from shareholders. Um, a thousand people lost their jobs, over a thousand people lost their jobs, and then they went bankrupt. But not only that, the CEO and the founder ended up in prison. Now, so here's, here's, here's the question. And we got failure, paper shredding, scam, uh, all these words. So, so you've heard of it. You know their reputation is still known today. And none of those executives started Enron and said, you know what? We want to build a company. We want to build this organization and take this group of people that we have. And at the end, we want to steal from them. We want to lie to them. And then you know what? The founder, you know, is going to end up in prison. Nobody said, hey, we want to build the company that does that. It's going to have us end up in prison. And we've, you know, it never happens that way. But culture is such a big deal. And somewhere along the line, the culture got very, very toxic at Enron. When you go back and you look at all the studies, strategy, they were killing it. They were killing it so much that they could steal $47 million from the, from the bottom line and no one would know for years. But culture ended up killing the company because of the level of fear and distrust and a lack of unity and lack of all the things we're going to talk about today here in just a second. So I want to give you a little bit of a glimpse of some cultures that are pretty awesome. Um, and then a couple that we would say are cultures that we would, we, we would hope not to be in. Uh, some, some of you might want to want to go and be a part of North Korea. That's fine. Uh, but I don't think anybody wants to be remembered as an Enron in any way. So we're going to dive in. And um, are we doing an assessment now? We're going to look at the, let's look at what's at stake before we do the assessment. In just a second, be thinking about this because we're going we're gonna to look at what's at stake. But I want you to think about this, and, and you're going to take a personal assessment here in just a second. But really, what's at stake? Real quick, time and resources. I mean, have you ever been on a team where there was a, a toxic individual? Don't put them in the chat. I don't want to, you know, no names. Uh, but there was a toxic individual or there was a toxic part of the team. How much time did the others spend on trying to make up, trying to figure out how to fix, trying to mediate between the, the, the frustration? Um, how much how many resources went to trying to fix that scenario? And then and revenue, how much money was spent? If you calculate all the calories and the hours that you spend, you know, the greasy wheel always gets the, the squeaky wheel always gets the grease. Well, in cultures, the toxic, the toxic person or the toxic group, subgroup within the culture, um, they're going to get the grease. You can't help but pay attention and spend time and money. So time, resources, revenue, employee retention. I always say the biggest what's at stake when, when, when you're not paying attention to your culture uh, is your employee retention. Your greatest advantage in building an intentional, healthy culture is your employee attraction. So there's two, there's two sides of that coin. Yes, you want to keep great people, but guess what? Money doesn't do that. Culture does. When you create an ethos and an environment and an experience where people enjoy spending time there, they want to stay there. And then other people hear about those kind of people that are in those environments and they want to come work with those people. And the people in the environments want to recruit their friends to come work with them because they're really proud of what they get to do because it's, it is a bit rare. So employee retention, big deal. I would say employee attraction, put that on the list too. Employee engagement. Um, think about teams you've been on when there's, there's been toxic frustration. There's been uh, conflicts that's avoided or it's dealt with in a really, really poor ways. And, and how does that team engage? Did that team engage and maximize the energy? Was that an innovative team? Was that a team that shared a lot of ideas? No. Employee engagement goes way down. Uh, I mentioned conflict resolution. That's probably where you see toxicity come out in a culture more than anywhere else is the way a, a, an organization, the way a family does conflict resolution. 
resolution. And it's, it's really, really toxic, really, really painful when you do conflict bad. And what's, what's even worse than doing conflict bad is completely avoiding it altogether. And then you have a bunch of passive aggressive people in the back talking about it, but never addressing it and talking about the person and the conflict. And, and it literally divides, divides families, divides, it's divided churches, it's divided companies, it's divided organizations, uh, it's divided football leagues. Um, over conflict that's not resolved. Uh, we've had marches and, uh, and, 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 and whole you know, baseball seasons have been shut down because of conflict resolution between, between owners and, and players. So, um, and then finally, sustain success. success. Um, when we have a toxic, you, just, you cannot sustain success. Enron is the example. Like you can go only so long and it will catch up when, with you. And it will eat you for breakfast. It will destroy you. It'll destroy your family. It'll destroy your team. Uh, it'll destroy you and your opportunity. It'll destroy your organization. So, um, so let's do a quick assessment real quick. Uh, Rachel, take, take them through this assessment, and then we'll pick up and really address kind of five areas of, of, of toxicity. Yeah, so here, this, this self-assessment, it'll be quick. We're going to go ask you five questions, and I want you to rate yourself on a scale of one to five, one being... I'm terrible at this or my team or my culture is just not doing well at this. Five being, man, we're hitting the nail on the head. We are excellent at this, right? And when you think about, you can gauge yourself as a leader, you can gauge the team that you're on, you can gauge the company that you're at, really whatever way that you want to learn and grow from what we share here today. But we really want to help you assess where you're at right now, understand that delta so that a lot of the things that Ford's going to unpack next, you can put them into practice um, we're all about practical application here at WildSpark. We say um, that learning without action is just entertainment. And so we definitely want to make sure you know where you are, where you need to go. That way, the stuff we talk about today, you can put into practice. So first question, and drop this stuff into, into the chat for us so we can kind of gauge maybe where some people are at and these different places where maybe you could grow as a leader or your team could grow. But the first one is in the area of trust. We operate cross-functionally and not in silos within our team. There seems to be a healthy dialogue around projects and a willingness to help others win. On a scale of one to five, where are you on that front? You know, and, and there's a reason why trust is the first, first one here, the first area we're talking about too. So I'm excited for, for Core to unpack okay. that in, in a little bit. But when you have trust as a foundation, Man, there's so much you can accomplish. And that's the key word. Foundation, foundation. Trust has to be the foundation. We'll talk about that in a second. But, uh, but hey, the good thing, you know, about low numbers. Now, yeah, hey, don't have to type them in the chat. If you want to, we can kind of see. Uh, but I, I always champion the lower numbers because you got, you got lots of room. And, and you're probably, you know, um, you're probably going to be a lot. You're going to be really encouraged at the end because there really is some pretty practical and easy things to build these things and work on these things. Yeah, it is ambiguous, but there's some practical things to do that can really change, change scenarios, uh, in, 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 it doesn't take forever. Yeah, we have some fours, we have a three, we have a two-ish. So, you know, that's good. There's lots of room to grow here and, and use what we learned today. The next one, others' stories. We know and understand each other's personal and professional stories in a healthy and meaningful way. How well do you know the people you work with and the things about their life? So we're, I'm excited to unpack that one too. Something I yep. heard when I first came to work for WildSpark is that a lot of the conflict that you run into with people at work, sometimes when you know their story, it, it really helps you kind of see them through a different lens. So that is such a game changer. So think about the people around you. Think about the people uh, you work with on a daily basis. You know, how well do you know their story on a scale of one to five? I can't remember who says the quote, but it's something along the lines of it's really hard to not love or care about someone once you know their story. And yeah. I've, I've seen that play true in my life for sure. I think it's Mr. Rogers who said that. Well, I, so I thought it was Mr. Rogers. I've been saying that. I looked it up the other day and someone said it was somebody else, but I think we should Ooh. give credit to Mr. Rogers. We'll go with right. him. I agree. Yeah, Semper Fi, Mr. Rogers was a Marine. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> I didn't know that. There you go. Okay. So more than a profit, gauge yourself here. We feel our work is meaningful and that although profits are important, they aren't the only thing our organization focus, uh, focuses on on the day to day. So are you guys focused on more than a profit? Is there something beyond that that binds you and really is an ancillary benefit to what you're also doing on the business front? One being we're not great at this. Five being we're excellent at this. 
And uh, yeah. one thing we talk a lot about at Wild Spark is is either people over, over profit or being relational over transactional. And that's just something that we really try to live out. And what's interesting is you f- I find a lot more satisfaction when it when it's about the other person, about the client. And maybe in the short run, you can end up you know getting a better profit if it's all about profit. But if we go back to that sustainability over a long period of time, it, it definitely pays off to, to put people over profit for sure. Amen. All right, next one, empathy or indifference. When decisions are made, it feels as though the leadership makes an effort to understand how it will affect team members, even when our input may not change the decision. So do you have a culture where the best idea wins? Do you have a culture where you're kind of open and secure to give feedback or to give your input? Or do people even ask you that? You know, that people even give you the, the credit or the dignity of sharing what you think? Or is that something that's only for a select few, right? Very good. And then our last one, company goals are connected to personal goals. And I love this one because so many people will think, what does that have to do? Like, what does that have to do with how I work, where I work? Like, why should they care? Right. And this was something that like radically changed how I approach work once I came to Wildspark and leadership of them started asking me this question. Right. It just makes you feel so valued. So ask yourself, is that, does our leadership understand my personal goals and desires, our personal goals and desires as a team? Do they seek to connect them to our business goals? Yep. All right. So you should have a good, healthy idea in these core areas we're going to talk about today, to talk about now, and that core is going to jump into about where you are, and we're going to kind of show you some some practical things and some encouragements to get you where you want to be. So awesome, awesome. All right, great. We'll tuck those numbers away. Um, and again, I said, as you're, as we're, as we're, as we're unpacking those, continue to think about the number you are, uh, you're at now and how we can, how we can, how we can get a Delta, how we can see and move this to a, if you're a three to a four a four to a five toxic, toxic, we're going to start with T. All right. So give me the T. The T is trust is a foreign language. All right. If there's a toxic culture, uh, just, just as Rachel said, trust is always the foundation and in a toxic culture, it's a foreign language. It's, it's not present. So if you're on a team right now and there is no trust and you feel like you're looking behind your back and, and around the corner to see, is there somebody that's going to take advantage of me? There is no trust on that team. And it, it, it is, it is, there's no foundation to really build any of the other, other aspects on. And so trust is a, is a super big deal. So I want to define it for you. How do you define trust? So our definition of trust is it's your confidence in someone's intent ability and execution all right trust the definition your your confidence in someone's intent ability and execution all right and one of those is very different than the other two all right and so i'll back into it execution is i do what i do my job i do it well and i do it consistently and faithfully and i follow through with it all the time and so if someone is 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 executing well, their ability and their execution, it's they do their job and they do it really well. Well, you may do your job consistently over and over and over again, but you don't have the ability. I'm working backwards. If, so, if you don't trust someone has the ability to do that job, it doesn't matter how faithful they are to do it over and over again. If they don't have the ability, you can't trust that they get it done. But if you back into the very first, the very first component, somebody's intent, if you don't trust that their intent towards you is good, that their agenda for you is to, to better you. If that is off, then the other two don't matter. And so you got to start with, what is the intent? Do I trust the intent? If you think about the team you're on, if you think about the team that you lead, it might be a great question. Hey, let's rank trust, ability, and intent. Um, but if intent is not there, then trust falls apart. If you are always having to second guess, is this person really have my best interest at heart? Or is this just about them and their agenda and what they can get from me? That is the that that erodes any kind of any kind of capability or, or capacity to build trust in a team. So intent is super super important to assess myself. Do my people trust me? Do they believe that I have their best interest at heart? Um, and so I, I love. I'm gonna, I want to share with you. There's what we call in our in our court in our. Uh, community and culture and organization, we call it vulnerability-based trust. Uh, it's, just not, it's not just trusting, because if you trust they can do the job and trust that you know, they execute it well all the time, that's one thing.
But to be able to be able to trust from a, from a place of vulnerability is really important. One of my favorite authors, Patrick Lencioni, The Advantage. I'm going to read this quote real quick. Vulnerability-based trust. This is what happens when members get to the point where they're completely comfortable being transparent, honest, and naked with one another. Where they say and genuinely mean things like, I screwed up. I need help. Your idea is better than mine. I wish I could learn and do that job as well as you do. Will you help me? They even can say often, I'm sorry. So just a quick little assessment. Can those words be a part, those words are part of your, of your culture? Have you built vulnerability-based trust? That's number one. We're going to move quick. Trust. Oh, all right. Do you have trust? Others' stories don't matter. All right. And we alluded to this earlier, but the, the greatest, and this is, this is exciting because the greatest way, if you don't have trust or if trust is the area that, man, you look and you assess your team, you assess your leadership, I've got to build trust. It's, 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 it's a low score. The very most practical way you can do that is to get context from your team, context individually and personally about who they are. It's absolutely the most foundational component that a leader, an action item that a leader does with someone else to get content, context and how to lead them. You simply hear their story. There's a great lesson in, in Wild Spark uh, called the Leader Launchpad. And we really do encourage our uh, anybody and our executives especially start with this, this unit. It's three lessons long. The first lesson is all about story. And it's simply teaching someone how to write their story in a very succinct and professionally appropriate way but then share the story. And we always have executives push back. Oh, I've been working with this team for 15 years. We don't need to go through story. And hands down every time they come back and they tell us, oh my gosh, Cord, you were, you were right. Hampton, you were right. We needed to start there. Oh my gosh, I've been working with these people for 15 years. And I never knew, I never knew that Joe worked three jobs in high school and college to, to take care of his mom. Um, I never knew that, that John, you know, dad died you know, in, in Afghanistan and, and the whole reason that he, man, makes sure that he is so effective and efficient with all of the, the anal things that we, we always kid him about is because his dad always, uh, being a Marine, always uh, made him make his bed, always made him. So when you get context from other people's stories, just like, just like Hampton said, you can't help but care for them. You can't help but have greater context into why they do some of the things that they do. So the greatest way you can begin, just to begin to build foundation, is to be interested in someone else, interested over, uh, over interesting, relational over transactional, and sit down and hear their story. If you've never heard your people's stories, that's what I want to challenge you to do over the next month, is simply schedule time and say, I want to hear your story. Give me the three to five major people experiences in your life that have shaped you into who you are. And just, I just want to know about you. When you hear people's stories, they feel known, seen, and heard. When they don't, they feel alone. So go back to the T, the trust. When there's no trust, it's a fear-based organization. When there's, no, when there's no stories, there's no context personally, it's an alone. It's a feeling of, of being alone in, in, in an organization. So fear and alone, that's, that's not driving a good culture. X, we couldn't find a word for X, so we used existing solely for profit. All right, when, when, when you think about your team and how you motivate your people, are they simply motivated because you hold them accountable to the numbers? It's all about the numbers. It's all about the quota. It's all about the bottom line. If it is, and that's the only way you motivate, the, the, the feeling is all you exist for is profit, and I am simply a cog in the wheel to get you what you want. And we feel the word is used. It just is what it is. And so, um, I, you know, when you think, oh, I don't, we, don't, we don't exist just for solely for profit. We, we have a foundation that we give to, or we, you know, we, we give to save the whales or clean oceans or whatever it is. And that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Like when you as a team think about the way, the reason we exist is to help each other have a better life, is to help each other get to a point in our lives where we can, we can improve uh, the, the, ourselves into a better version of who we are so that we can give our families a better version of who they are. Um, the one thing we all have in common is that we have people in our cultures. That's the one thing that, that makes culture different from strategy. It's all about people. And so if you work with people, you have a purpose. It's just how often are you highlighting the motivation for your people that work for you around the things that aren't connected to the bottom line? How many times do you affirm them for, for, for how they're treating another person on the team? 
for how they've, they've given innovative ideas uh, to, to, to the team that's, that's made us better? How much are you focusing on and affirming and encouraging and celebrating who they are not outside of just their numbers? When have you looked someone in the eye and said, wow, you are a, you are an incredibly caring person. You are an incredibly sharp leader. You are an incredibly intentional, uh, in, in, intentional uh, person, the way that you think. So um, I, I want to challenge you to exist solely for a purpose. Just start giving people identity. Uh, you are and not thank you for doing X, mainly the numbers. All right, existing solely for profit. We got two more. We're going to hit them really quickly. Indifference. All right, there, there's nothing. There, there's a couple angles to this. Um, the first is when it, 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 we've all been on a team where someone just didn't care. They literally didn't care. They didn't care about being there outside of the fact that they got a paycheck. It's kind of the opposite of, of you know, a boss existing solely for profit. Well, this is the employee that's existing solely just, just to get a paycheck. They're not there for any other reason, and you know they just really don't care. They don't care about the team's goals. They don't care if we innovate. They don't care if we get creative. They don't care if we – uh, we just saved the, the team or the company some money. They just don't care. They go to work and they punch a clock and they spend their time. They don't invest their time. It's such a frustrating uh, in, encounter and struggle and engagement and when, when people don't care. Now, the other side of that is when leadership doesn't care. And what I mean by that is not they don't care for you so much as they don't care to involve you. They have no empathy or engagement with you and they don't bring you into decisions. Your voice doesn't matter to them. And so you feel very indifferent uh, to their empowerment because they're, they're not empowering. And so indifference is really um, when you don't have trust, you don't know stories, you exist solely for profit. This is typically ends up with a very careless uh, organization uh, 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 when, when, there's, when there's no uh, care and there's no engagement uh, and a family, and a group, and a li- whatever it is, um, there's a feeling of indifference, and it's very, it's very frustrating. So T O X I, and then finally C, company and personal goals are disconnected. All right, we all work. Every one of us have one thing in common. We all go to work primarily to do what? To take care and give a better life to our families. Some of you that are single, that's you right now, but eventually you'll more than likely be a part of a family and you're going to your work so that you can make a better life for your family. To the degree that you know what that looks like with your people or that your people know what that looks like with you is to the degree that you really feel connected to them. We call this boardroom to family room. And we realize that 80,000 hours of somebody's life are going to be spent, as me as the CEO, I realize that they're going to spend the majority of their lives with me. And so if I can connect the dots with how what we're doing here at WildSpark helps them hit their home runs at home and with their family and their goals, then I have a whole new level of motivation and engagement and retention with those people. Now, so here's how you get there. I I mentioned the leader launch pad. The first lesson was story. Well, we have a second month. The second is identity. If you know where somebody's been, you've heard their story. And then if you know who they are, you know their identity. So we do a little disc assessment in Wild Spark and you learn their identity. But then that third lesson to finish out the unit is do you know where they want to go in life? Meaning, do you know their goals, their personal goals? And to the degree, if you sat down with the people on your team and say, hey, I've heard your story. You got to start there. But now I really want to know, what do you want? What do you want? What are your goals? What are your personal goals for your family? Uh, what, what do you have? What's your five-year goal for your finances? What's your five-year goal for your fitness, for, 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 for you outside of work? Because I want to make sure that what we're doing here connects there. If you will connect company goals to personal goals, your team goals to personal goals, and ask the questions, man, what, what legacy do you want to leave? Like, I want to help you get there. I want to help you get to a place where you're better Whenever you leave, whenever you launch, or if you're here for the next 20 years, that we would know that you didn't just help the company hit their goals, but we helped you hit yours too. To the degree that you connect those two things, you get people running through brick walls. You will run through a brick wall. Um, When someone sits down with me and says, man, hey, um, I know that one of your goals is to get all of your kids in college. That's one of my goals. I've shared that with a lot of people when they ask me my goals. Um, And they come to me as the CEO and say, well, hey, Here's the deal. 
I want to help you hit your goal. And I, it's usually because I've asked. I've asked them their goals, and they asked me mine. But it's cool when they say, hey, guess what? Uh, you've heard mine, and I want to help you hit your goal of getting all your kids you know, through college, all six of them. It's a pretty cool conversation, and we both kind of leave. If it's me and, me and Hampton, chest bumping, because I'm going to help him hit his goals. He's going to help me hit mine. And we're both committed on this side of the uh, on this side of the equation in the business time, in the business world with our company, uh, man, to go run through brick walls together. So uh, where do you see toxicity in your in your culture, the culture that you own, that you create, that you're a part of? And, and, and where can you take some steps with these examples to move forward? Uh, I hope that's something that we've challenged you to do today and um, been fired up to to talk about this. Fired up. There it is. That was that was the second or third time we've heard it, and I'm fired up too, Cord. Thank you just for going through that. We'll unpack that a little bit more and send you all just some information after to be able to to reflect because that was that was a lot. But now we want to hear from you. What questions do you have for Cord? You've got him here right now. Uh, there's no bad questions. Uh, let's see what you got. We're ready for you. Yeah, drop them in the chat. Um, Cord will answer them right here live. But one question. So before we actually had the webinar and we were telling people about it, we asked people to send in their questions. And one question that we got, Cord, was how does somebody in maybe a mid-level manager position, um, how do they influence culture when it isn't necessarily something that they own in their role? What can somebody like that do to try and influence up? Like we talk about North, South, East, West. Like how can somebody do that if they nope. feel like they don't know where to start? Yeah, and I and I'd say own the domain that's been given to you, right? And I and I gave, I gave the, the 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 analogy or the example earlier from Jim Collins, "Good to Great." It's a quote actually, where he says, "Managers trump companies," and so so few times do we do we remind ourselves that I can that the best way I can change and and get the attention of folks above me is to make change and have my people talk and rave about the way I lead them. And so, again, if, whether or not you lead one person or you lead a team or a whole department, to the degree that you can start applying some of these things, uh, you, you can be interested over interesting. And to the degree that, you know, over the next, it might take you a quarter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to everybody's story. You know, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go look at their identity assessment. If you do an identity assessment uh, with them and I'm going to ask them, hey, the way you're wired up, how, how do you. How, how could I lead you better knowing that you're you're wired up a little different than these other people on the team, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, have, the, have the legacy. I mean, there's just apply these things to your people and it takes time. Yes. You don't have control um, to just go write a new policy. Um, but I, it, and, and one other thing I would say is right now we're doing what we call dream sessions uh, with, with our team. And so at the end of the year, we do our formal evaluation, but in the middle of the year, we do what's called a dream session. And any leader, any manager can do a dream session with their people. And even the title of it is inviting. It's, look, I do a dream session about mid-year because I just want you to dream with me. And I want to dream with you about where you want to be in, in one year and in three years. Asking those two questions reveals so much. Inviting them into those two questions will empower them in a way that conversation you will have with them will tell you so much, but it will also invite them in in such a way that you will build some really incredible rapport that will be a great movement forward with your culture. So excited about all my dream session meetings right now. That's good. Great answer right there. It doesn't look like we have anything in the chat right now, so please uh, add your questions, but I'll throw one out here for a minute. Um, Cord has done a really good job of just making himself available to uh, receive feedback to, to answer hard questions. It takes a lot of humility to do that. And I know it's not, um, it's definitely not, not normal, but core, can you, can you describe or share like how it has benefited you as a leader and benefited our company that you've allowed people two, three, often four layers below you to, uh, to maybe give you a call and go that last 10% or give you some feedback on a presentation uh, in an appropriate way. I mean, just, just to encourage yeah. the leader on this call to maybe open up the floor for their people to do that. Yeah. So first of all, I let them know it's an expectation from day one that I want them giving feedback 360 degree. We call it, we call it 360 degree leadership development. That's East, West, North, and South. That's, Hey, I want you to encourage and give feedback to those that are your peers. I want you to lead up 
and that means your, your boss, your supervisor, your direct report. Um, and then eventually, if you'll do those, those two things, you're going to get the opportunity to lead down. We're going to give you a team. We're going to give you somebody else to lead. Uh, but you have, to, you have to be okay giving and receiving feedback. So that's, that's an expectation I give. And then I give him the example. I expect you to give me some feedback. How can I learn from you? And I, and I think Gavin is actually on this, this call. He's a new team member of ours. Hadn't been with us, but uh, what, is it, what is it, Hampton? Four months? Uh, something like that. I mean, uh, around a quarter, Gavin. Okay, so I'm, I'm right. shouting him out right here. But he called me about a week and a half ago. And, and said, hey, hey, Cord, and, and, and did this really, really well. And, man, I want to encourage you in a couple areas. And then I, I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to do this. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't be hesitant. I hope I think I know where you're going. He says, yeah, I got, some, I got the last 10% that I want to give you. Um, and in one of my talks, I had misspoke and said something that really put the, the, all of our remote employees, um, it, it just cast a, a little bit of a dark, cloud that I didn't know I didn't had no idea I did it and he he shared it with me and it I was so thankful I was so encouraged like I can go now I, he's made me better I have grown I have developed I'm more thoughtful I was able to go back I'm able to go back now and, and make sure I communicate the what I communicate in a different way so leaders ask for feedback the one you don't have to go start giving it I, I'm do not go and start giving it immediately take a month and take everybody on your team and three times over the next month, ask them to give you feedback. Hey, I know we just did that sales demo. You were on with me. Give me feedback. What could I do better? What did you notice? What's something that you really do well that, man, you, you, could, you could share with me that you're doing uh, that I could improve on? I promise that will start to radically shake your culture. They might, they might think you're crazy at first. They might think, okay, what, what, what's he doing here? Where's, where's, you know, if you'll start asking that question, give Will you give me feedback on this? Help me grow. Help me about that. Change your culture. We had a great question in the comments from Josh Berkey, I think. I hope I said your name right, Josh. Trust is something that is built. What are a few proactive things a leader should do to build that confidence in someone's intent, ability, and execution? Yep. Well, I would say you celebrate, champion, and then challenge. You have to do all three on a consistent basis. Um, and, and those are three very – got to treat those as three very different aspects of an individual. They're three different degrees of trust. And so I think even having, having the conversation where someone you – know, that's, that's your job as a leader, as a manager, is to go and at times give feedback, right, and help someone grow and get better at something they're not doing well. Um, and so – Hopefully it's not an intent. Hopefully you really believe, man, they're trying their best. And it's, you know, it's, it's when it's an ability or an execution conversation that we can be pretty tactical and we come in and I always celebrate something I've seen them do well. Um, I champion who they are, their identity. I've seen the way you are closing deals at a, at a different rate than you were a month ago. Um, I, you, you are a tenacious and consistent person. Like, I got, that's, a, that's a character trait of yours that I've seen. I'm super proud of that. So I've, I've, sh I've said something I've seen. I'm connecting it to the identity of who they are. And then I say, but hey, there's, there's this area that, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're doing incredible with the clients, but you're not getting your, your CRM info into Salesforce fast enough. And we're coming. So I, I want to challenge you in that because, man, you got so, so much potential. And I know that's not the, 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 the most exciting thing to do, but that you got to double down there. So um, now, when it's intent, if intent is the issue, it's a little more challenging. Um, but I think to be real and to come in and say, hey, you know, there's been some things that have caused me to wonder, and I always want to expect the best, but I know you said something in the meeting the other day in front of another person that, that sounded a little degrading, and it, 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 it sounded like there might be. And so you're not... A, the, the worst thing you can do is accuse, but to, to, to give someone a specific example and to say why there could be some, some potential danger in, in the way that came out and a negative effect. And I just want to address that with you and, and hopefully we can work through. And then they'll talk and tell you whether or not there's intent. I mean, they'll, they'll, as they share, they're going to tell you um, or you're going to be able to sense is there intent? Is this personal? There's a personal vendetta uh, against another person because that's, in culture, like when you're battling for culture, those are the things you got to sniff out. 
you got to bring people to do conflict well, especially when it's personal. So that's a whole nother soapbox, but big part of, of, of a leader doing culture where is identifying when there's conflict between two different individuals on any team that they're in charge of, uh, and then being able to pull those people together and have them deal with that conflict well. Great answer. Uh, the last thing that we want to talk about is just who we are at Wild Spark and what we want to give to you. You might be fired up right now. You're ready to run through a brick wall with Cord because you're, you're sitting here on a webinar listening to Cord, but you're about to get off this webinar and you might walk into a meeting with someone, your, somebody on your team and you might see some of these toxic elements that we've talked about and then there's discouragement all of a sudden. You know, our, our goal is for, for you, your organization, to learn in circles and not, not a row. Like right now, you're in a row. You're sitting in your seat. You're listening to core. This is awesome. Uh, but what would it look like for you to take this to your organization and have these conversations? Because I bet they don't happen on accident, at least consistently. Sometimes those conversations happen where if we go back to building trust with someone or hearing people's stories um, or talking about why the business is more than just about profit. Like occasionally you might have a lunch conversation or a water cooler conversation with somebody about that. But I bet just because of um, the busyness and the, and the demands of your job, if you're not creating time to have these conversations, they're just not going to happen. And so the purpose of WildSpark is to help you master consistency with talking about things like culture, things like feedback and healthy conflict. And so, um, Rachel, if you want to go to the next slide, I can talk about some of these content topics. So what WildSpark is, and I know a lot of you do it, um, so maybe this can be a, a, a energy boost to, to re-inspire you to engage. And if you're, if you're in HR or a CEO or interested in WildSpark, hopefully this can enlighten you on what this is. A lot of what we do uh, is content like this. So each month, you actually will see Cord or, or, or Rachel in a Wild Spark lesson on something like cultivating culture or building extraordinary teams. It's going to be short learning burst where you just get to learn about one of these principles. If you were to do a lesson within cultivating culture, you would hear a lot of what Cord just shared. So maybe you can't get everyone from your company on a webinar. Maybe you can't get all of your managers on the webinar to listen to Cord, but you can get them in Wild Spark to do that lesson. We have some things in place for some accountability to make sure that people do that. But here's the best part. Again, we really believe that people grow best in circles, not rows. So at the end of the month, if you're doing this with 50 managers, we'll break you into a couple of small groups and we give you a list of questions. Maybe you get to be one of the, uh, the team facilitators that just says, hey, WildSpark said that it's really important to talk about X in our culture or, or we're going to drift. And so then you talk about that. And what does it do? We don't create toxic cultures overnight. Imran, they did not uh, start from day one and then just uh, end up with a horrible culture. It, it happened over time. And I think that these monthly meetings that we're trying to provide you with WildSpark help you ask the question, where are we one degree off? And let's get back in line and have these conversations within building extraordinary teams. Um, a couple of the pillars that we talk about are uh, the best idea wins. So maybe you're the manager, maybe you're the boss, but ask the people on your team. That's going to build trust. That's going to show them that you care about them. Or we teach you to pursue healthy conflict. We, we've talked about this on this webinar. Go the last 10%. And that doesn't happen without trust, which again, a lot of that is built on this next slide, leader launch pad right there. Core talked about the story lesson. It's undefeated. Everybody loves it where you get together and just talk with each other about your story. So the reason that we share this with you at the end is, a lot of times we have our aggressive learners that come on these webinars or you're in HR and you're responsible for leadership development within your organization. We're not going to ask you to, to get every one of your managers to come listen to Cord. We want you to experience one of these lessons and then talk about how it applies to your team specifically. Like that is the goal of, of what we're doing at WildSpark. And so again, it's a monthly strategy. You do a lesson and then have a team meeting on a content topic like one of these, like trust or story or what legacy do you want to leave? Um, and so the last thing that I just want to say is like Cord really means everything that he says. And you might, you know, you might hear that and, and say, man, I, I wish my CEO would say that. And to that, I might tell you, um, message me. We might be hiring. Uh, <laughs> but but on, a, on a serious note, Cord often says like, I want to tee you up to date your spouse if you have one, 
coach your kids if you have them and serve in your community. And so I hope uh, that that's something that if you're a leader, you're able to do for your people. And if Wild Spark is interesting to you, if you want to learn more, you can talk with us. You can schedule a meeting with me. Uh, who knows? Maybe I'll bring Court along. I can't promise that, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, so if you can scan that QR code, you can meet with us and we can just dive into Wild Spark and unpack it a little bit more for you. That's great stuff, guys. And then the other thing, too, just to, to build off of what Hampton said, is that it is it is difficult. It is an uphill battle to try and be a single individual to take this stuff to your team and influence that change among others. But when you have a system in place and when you have a common leadership language, you don't have a lot of misunderstandings about how you resolve conflict. You don't have a lot of misunderstandings about how you give feedback, right? Having a common leadership language and common leadership frameworks that everybody can grab from, it just gives you this really solid foundation and level playing ground that is going to be the game changer for those long-term culture changes. So we want to set you up for success like that. We're so excited that you're here today. I mean, the fact that you showed up here to even hear about and culture and learn from Cord, you know, you're obviously a special person who can be a game changer in your organization. So if there's anything we can do for you, Please feel free to, you can scan this QR code, reach out to us on wildspark.com on our LinkedIn page. Um, and we'd love to just be here for you and serve you in any way that we can. Thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon. Uh, wherever you are, we hope it's been um, just helpful to you. And if there's anything we can do for you as a Wildspark squad, just, just let us know. Yeah, reach hey, out. Uh, if, if anybody had any other questions you want to shoot over, um, Hampton can get those to me and I'd be glad to, uh, to get an answer back over to you one way or the other. Yeah. Hey, Court, right, I'll, I'll put the ball in your court for this, but maybe you can leave us with the leaders ready. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If, if you've been around the Wild Spark team, you know, we, we, we get fired up. We got war cries. We got, you know, we, we just we want to stay on our game. And so the, the uh, you know, the whole deal is, is, is if you build within your culture, within your family, within any organization that you want to have influence. And, and as you grow, the one thing that you're going to need that that you can't go by, you can't go provide in any other way as leaders ready. And if you're an organization, if you're a team, you want to know how to get promoted in your organization, it's get leaders ready. Uh, if you want to, as an organization, know how to cut, you know, have the competitive advantage, uh, get leaders ready. And so at the end of the day, leaders ready. There we go. Ready. We'll see you all in July. Let's Bye, go. Bye, everyone.